This is probably the only time I'm going to use clickbait to get you guys to click on a video. But before you skip and go to the next video, give me a chance to explain. It is easy to make $500 with bug bounties. It is absolutely doable. And I think anybody could do it if they put in the right amount of time and effort. If you're here to quickly make $500, let me tell you that you can scale that and also do it consistently because eventually all those bugs are going to dry up and you're going to run out of ideas to find vulnerabilities that are easy and high in reward. I know when I say high in reward, 500 may not be a lot to a lot of people depending on what your current financial situation is. But again, spending a couple of hours to make $500 is a good amount of money and it's high in return and in the ROI. Let me tell you what I meant when I said this is a clickbait video. I wanna to talk to the crowd and the people that are watching these videos, hoping for an overnight success with bug bounties and to make a quick buck. Again, that's not going to happen, but what I am willing to give you is, I'm going to tell you the five most common vulnerabilities and how you can look for them in theory and how to become a better at them in order to be able to report bounties that are worth $500 or more. So this video is the five top most common vulnerabilities, how to look for them and how to get better at them. And at the end of the video, what I need you to do is tell me, do you like this content and do you want me to make a hands-on version of this video where I actually do a demo of each vulnerability type and show you how to look for them? So that is on you. You got to drop me a comment. You can do it now. We can just kick back, watch the video and do it later. And before I talk about these five vulnerabilities, keep in mind, some of these are technical. You have to understand some level of HTML and web technologies, while others are just purely based on logical vulnerabilities that you can find within an application. Number one, as always, it is going to be cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting is probably the number one vulnerability that is being reported on these bug money platforms like HackerOne, BugCrowd, and Integrity. There is a lot of cross-site scriptings that are still out there that you can look for, but it comes with understanding how and where to put your payload. The number one thing that I see in a lot of my courses, a lot of the students that I work with, the people that I mentor is, Everybody wants to just copy paste the most simple cross-site scripting payload into every field. And when they don't see that alert one popping up, they're going to give up and move on to the next field. Honestly, that is the worst way to look for cross-site scripting. And I think the best approach is to understand the context where you put in your text and seeing where your text ends up. Because in a lot of times when you have a test one, two, three, for example, that you put into your browser, we put in for your name, or maybe you put into a parameter in the URL address bar that is going to come up in different contexts. For example, it may come into a script tag, it may come into an input field, it may come into just a random div. Each of those you can escape and get out of differently. And sometimes an image tag with an alert one isn't going to work in the context of a script tag. And instead you have to close the script before you can inject your image tag. If you are a visual person and none of this makes sense, don't worry, go to my YouTube channel, look for my blind cross site scripting video, this one right here and check it out. I talk about blind cross site scripting, but in that entire video, I also cover the context and how to look for these different contexts and get out of them for cross site scripting. If you want to become good at cross site scripting, every single input field, anywhere there's a form that you can put in your name where it gets saved, you should check for cross site scripting. Every parameter in the get request that you see in the address bar, when it says every parameter, you should test for cross site scripting anywhere that it takes your user input and it shows into the source or the DOM of the page is a great place to look for cross site scripting. Look at the context of where your text and input goes to and try to break out of it and inject JavaScript within it. So that's number one, an easy one. I think you should absolutely learn cross-site scripting and then move on to CSRF or cross-site request forgery, which is also kind of technical, but not really. If you already have Burp Suite Pro where it has a CSRF POC generator, it's easy to test for these, but the whole concept with CSRF is to trick your user or your victim, which could be your secondary browser, to make an action without their knowledge. So anytime you see a form or an action like editing your payments, editing your email, editing your account, your name, your whatever information that's on this website, all of those different actions, if it's a different endpoint, is a great place 
to look for CSRF. But that's just a basic way of doing CSRF. You also have to pay attention to how this website is authorizing you to use its resources. Are they using just a cookie? What are the different parameters in this cookie? Are there any custom headers? What happens if you remove those headers? Can you still authenticate into this application? Sometimes they give you a CSRF token in the header where you can just remove it or reuse your own CSRF token against your victim and it still works. So you have to keep all of these in mind while you're looking for CSRF vulnerabilities. I honestly don't report a lot of CSRFs. I do them on the pen tests and some of these other engagements that I do where I know the client or the customer cares for it. But when it comes to bug bounty, I typically don't report CSRF unless I can chain it with another vulnerability or if it's in a very sensitive action like a change password, change email, and so on. Those are the ones that I would look for. But honestly, I know people that are really, really good at CSRF and sometimes if you have a cross-site scripting that is done in a post request that could be only a self XSS, you can combine it with CSRF and get that self XSS to go from self XSS to an exploit against another user. So keep those two in mind. They could go very well in hand in hand. It's a really, really good exploit to have in, the, in your tool belt to look for them. And it's just something that you see a lot of developers make mistakes with. And I've seen a lot of bug bounty programs that are awarded. So those are the two so far that are kind of technical, but you can honestly, you can learn all these super easy. You don't have to learn a lot of stuff. It's just, it's a really good place for beginners to get started with bug bounties and something to look for while they learn more of the complex vulnerabilities like SSRF, RCEs, and all these more complex technology stacks and ideas. The third one that I want to talk about is IDOR or insecure direct object reference. That's when you are able to just to pretty much change the value of a lot of times the integer in the address bar in the post request or the put request from an integer ID number to another one and it leaks the data for another user. So for example, if your user ID is 10, what happens if you change that 10 to an 11? Is it going to leak the data that belongs to user ID 11 that is not yours and present it to you? A lot of times it's super simple like this that you have an integer and you change it but a lot of times you also see companies that use different ways to hash the user IDs that could make it more complicated. So a lot of times like this, what you want to do is you want to find a way to leak that user ID. What I recommend a lot of times to a lot of the people that I work with that come to me like, hey, I have an IDOR, but I can't get the user ID. What do I do? I recommend maybe reporting that user's profile and seeing if it passes the hash to the report functionality or maybe just interacting with the user, looking at the user profile image and so on. So that's one of the things that I really recommend looking at, but also these IDORs become way more complex on larger organizations where you are a user belonging to another organization or another group where the group ID has its own ID. Then you have your own ID and the objects that you own, for example, your address, your orders or whatever it is, have their own ID and the combination of three become very hard to guess where you have to brute force for. So in a lot of cases, when I do something like this and what I recommend to my students when we have these courses is to make sure they create two different profiles, two different companies, and use two different web browsers to be able to track and look for these vulnerabilities. So that means that in browser number one, you have one account and browser number two is the other. This way, when you're making these requests, you grab the request from browser one, you plug them into two or the session for browser two, and you see if you can retrieve data that belongs to this user using this other browser. This is probably the easiest way to look for IDORs. And honestly, it's something that I do for every pen test bug bunny that I do. I always have two accounts. It just makes it easier. I don't have to guess for information. And once I have a vulnerability, when I can't leak the the user ID, that's when I look for escalation paths to look and see if it's possible to leak the user ID in some way. So the exploit and the criticality of it goes to a higher degree. So keep that in mind when you do it, get the two browsers running. It will save you a lot of time and effort and also keep you sane when you're looking at vulnerabilities in complex applications. Number four, authorization issues. This is absolutely one of my favorite things to look for, especially when it comes down to a pen test or large enterprise software, because this is where most of the vulnerabilities lie because they're getting a lot of pen tests and bug bounty folks that are looking at these exploitable vulnerabilities like cross site scriptings and IDOR, but no one's looking at the different access controls. So when I say looking for authorization issue is looking at different permissions that are allowed within an application. What is an admin allowed to do? What is a user allowed to do? What about their manager? Is there a manager level that sits between the admin and the end user that have specific access. So if you have access to an admin account, a lot of times when you do a bug bounty program, they give you access, they give you a promo for the trial. You can log in, create an admin, and then create the other two user levels and start testing them out. And that's similar to IDOR as well, 
All you have to do is send a request. For example, for the admin, you change the organization name where the end user or the regular users don't have access to that functionality. You just swap the cookies or you swap the authentication header and you see if you can still successfully change the company's name. And if you don't have permission to that functionality with your regular user, that is a beautiful and easy vulnerability to report. The more user permissions you have, the more complex this gets because a lot of times these permissions are custom. So you have to kind of create a spreadsheet, label all the different user functionalities, their groups, and go through them one by one. This is one that I would like to make a video and I need to hear from you. Do you want to see it? And also there is an amazing talk from the HomeCon, I think, that we did last year. I could be mistaken. It might be the year before, but there is a talk on the HomeCon. I will also link that down below. You should definitely check it out, but it's an amazing place to explore this vulnerability type more. This is one of the most underrated vulnerability types that a lot of people don't look at. So keep that in mind. That was number four. And we're going to move on to our last one. Number five, which is leak credentials and this is probably one that is very popular but the reason why i've put this in this video is you don't have to be super technical to understand how to look for leaked credentials you just have to know what to look for on github so you have to kind of learn how to use github you have to log into it there's some search limitations on there but there is a video also on my channel with godfather orwa he did a good recon video where he talked about how he looks for him but honestly this is super easy all you have to know is what technology stacks or what third-party vendors does this company use go to those vendors companies look at the documentation learn how they label their api keys or sensitive password or keys or things like that and look for those with your company's name or company domain that api key name on github and see what you find honestly the combination of things you can find is really really interesting but outside of just looking for leak credentials looking at github to find additional endpoints additional functionality ways to authenticate leak credentials all of this and all this are different combinations that you can use when it comes down to bug bounty hunting and looking for leaked information on the internet and github isn't the only place but is the most common one that i know a lot of people take a look at so those are the top five that i think anybody today could learn them within a few hours there are a lot of great resources online to learn xss and csrf and idor those three are very very easy to learn with the authorization issues you just have to understand how to browse the different functionalities and just know how to proxy your web request using burp and then repeating it with a different user session and then the last one that i just talked about the leak credentials and leaked information super easy you just looking for information there's no technical skills to this but unfortunately the reality of it is companies still to this day submit their passwords and credentials to github and other repositories and it gets leaked for hackers to score easy bounties all right that's it let me know in the comments do you want to see a hands-on version of this video where i can make some labs and you can follow along what else do you want to see in this channel i would love to hear from you drop me a comment and if you haven't already do me a favor there are two things that i want to ask you for a favor if you've stuck around this long is one hit that subscribe button turn on the notification bell so when i drop a video every monday you're the first to hear from me and also i've opened up subscriptions where you can support the channel where you can become a paid subscriber and all the funds goes into making this channel and growing it more and more all right that's it see you all next monday peace